Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we are going to discuss about the Syrian situation and what's happening there on the ground. To discuss the issue we have with us, Prabir Purka is the chief editor News Click. Welcome to News Click, Prabir. So there are two narratives that are coming from Aleppo. One is that it has been freed, it has been liberated, and another about the brutal violence that is going on there. So what is actually happening there? Well, you know the interesting part is also the language used. The one on one hand, the Western media, and almost uniformly, the entire Western media is talking about the fall of Aleppo. At the same time, when they talk about Mosul, for instance, is the liberation of Mosul. When they talk about Pamira, where ISIS has recaptured, as they are calling it, it's recapture of. Uh, a Pamira by I ISIS. So each of these cases, the language used to be seems to be very different. The second part of it, and I think that's very important to understand, that urban warfare is brutal. The other part of the, the so-called fall of Aleppo, you must understand, there is Western Aleppo and Eastern Aleppo. And the Eastern Aleppo is a much smaller part in population terms than Western Aleppo, which has been under the control of the uh, Assad forces right from the beginning. Gov Syrian government has controlled Western Aleppo. And it has about a million people. Eastern Aleppo originally had about 300,000 people. Now, how many people were left before this offensive, we really don't know. There have been various figures. Uh, there have been figures as low as 25,000 to 90,000 by the Russians to United Nations, which has said 250,000. We really don't have any clue about the figures. But it is clear that 250,000 is a gross overestimate. About 35,000 seem to have come out initially when the pocket was half liberated. So you already saw about 35,000 come out, Six to 7,000 went to the Kurdish areas, rest came to the government areas. And this process has continued. Now it's also true that in the evacuation which has finally been agreed to with a lot of difficulty, the Russians gave the eastern Aleppo rebels, and again the eastern Aleppo rebels are really uh, the forces led by Al-Qaeda today. So they were given a safe passage to Idlib area. About 7,000 to 8,000 people have been evacuated. But it is very clear, and this Robert Fisk, for instance, has written, that there are very, very different narratives depending on which side you are on. And it's important to realize most of the narratives of the Western media really come from what is called the white helmets. And white helmets have been funded, about $100 million have been funded by the British and the American government. Yeah, because if one could look at the different media and the social media, a lot of photos being circulated and the questions are being raised that do they actually belong to Aleppo or not. So, I mean, what is, what's the interest of these Western media houses or the different things that you have pointed out? What's the interest that these narratives are being drawn from? Well, it's very clear that the Western narrative in Syria has been that Bashar al-Assad's government is illegal and should be overthrown. This has been, by all accounts, not only a civil war, but a proxy war. So that's been the, the picture from the beginning. It's a Western governments, NATO governments, along with Qatar and Saudi Arabia and Turkey earlier. Turkey has come out of the equation a bit right now. These have been the ones who have instigated the war in Syria, which in some sense the Syrians have been the victims. No excuses for Bashar al-Assad's government. That's really not the point. But nevertheless, this has been a proxy war. That's, that's very clear. So they are interested in vilifying Bashar al-Assad as much as possible. In some sense, also to give strength to their original narrative that Bashar is the, Assad is the villain and we are the good guys, irrespective of the good guys being Al-Qaeda or ISIS, which is what the two opponents are. You talked about the pictures that have come out. You know, manufactured news is really what I would call as armed propaganda. And this has been what the, the really the UK and the US has perfected, starting with the weapons of mass destruction, if you remember, that this has become something which they seem to have now uh, created in, in, in terms of being able to control the global narrative. If you look at, for instance, entire global media, most correspondents don't exist in most parts of the world. So they get their feed from AFP, Reuters, etc. And which are today highly doctored. So it seems to be a very complicated and complex situation. A lot of parties are involved. So there's a Syrian, Russian, Iranian uh, section, then there's a ISI section and their affiliates and the Kurdish forces also. So can you just throw some light on this complexity and what actually is the geopolitics of that area currently? It's clear that Aleppo is a watershed. 
Aleppo was the second most important town in Syria after Damascus uh, being the most important one, the capital. It was the commercial uh, capital of Syria. So it had a bustling industry, it had a commercial zone, it has one of the oldest souks in Middle East, West Asia. In fact, Damascus and uh, Aleppo are supposed to be the two oldest urban settlements that we have in the world today, which still continue as urban settlements. So Aleppo is a very important uh, uh, city uh, for, for Syria. And it's also true that when the, in, in 2012, when the rebels or the uh, Al-Qaeda okay. forces took over where eastern Aleppo, that they dismantled the industry, in fact, took it to Turkey. A lot of the industrial equipment was sent to Turkey. So Aleppo has really seen the ravage of the civil war for the last four years. So its fall to Assad's forces is certainly a very important uh, landmark in what's developing. If we look at the map of Syria, you will see the most of the settlements, people who are there, densely populated areas, run from south west to northwest up to Latakia. This is the area which is most populated. It has a significant part of the what they are calling the Al uh, Alawite population as well, but still majority is Sunni. So this is 80% of Syria's population and major towns are here. So if you look at this belt, then today the picture is apart from Idlib, which is the district which is north uh, west of uh, Syria, in northwest of Syria. Apart from this, there are now pockets near Damascus, pockets near the, uh, the Jordan, Jordanian border, pockets near Homs and Hamas, where there are still uh, some of the uh, Syrian rebel forces, which owe allegiance to Al-Qaeda and uh, Arar al-Sham. So the two major uh, elements which are there in this area. And this is slowly going to be mopped up. Already there are agreements of the kind which allowed Aleppo evacuation to, to take place. Similar evacuation has been going on and the troops, the rebel troops have been going to Idlib, which, is, which has become the quote unquote where all of these forces are ending up in. So what's going to happen is this, this entire area except Idlib is going to be slowly removed of all these forces. So this is one part. The other part of it is, of course, the eastern yes. Syria, which is largely desert, which has a few towns. There is or uh, Palmyra is an old town, not such a big one as of now, but it has historical importance. And of course, Raqqa, which is the supposed headquarters of ISIS. Yes. So these are the three towns which are, uh, the there is or is under siege. Palmyra has been taken back by ISIS. And uh, you have Raqqa, which is still controlled by ISIS. These are the three major towns. But eastern Syria is largely unpopulated and has some oil wells. But apart from that, there is not much of significance economically or in terms of population to eastern Syria. So that's not their main target as far as the Syrian government is concerned. Their target has been the western part of Syria. The northern part of Syria has this additional complication. There are Kurdish pockets, which is the Rojava uh, cantons they, that they want to create. with a contiguous border from right from uh, contiguous pocket right from Haska up to Latakia. That's the, uh, the northern part of Syria. And apart from now, the area near Al-Bab, uh, Jablus, this is the part where uh, Turkish forces have come in. The Kurds really control almost the entire part. So the question is, what is the relation between Turkey and uh, a Syrian government on one side? And the other part of it is what the Kurds are going to do. De facto, there seems to be an understanding between Kurds and the Syrian government still, apart from the little breakdown which took place in Hasaka, where there was a, some fighting. They seem to have decided not to fight each other. And even in Aleppo, there, is, there seems to have been de facto coordination between the Kurds, which are really in the north of Aleppo uh, city. They were really occupying a part of northern Aleppo city and the Bashar al-Assad government, so Syrian government forces. So that is still there. Turkey, after the coup and Russia's role uh, in supporting Erdogan, uh, there seems to have been a thaw in Russia-Turkey relations. It appears that they are not going to fight each other. The Turkey-Russian relationship improved because of the coup and Turks 
uh, disillusionment or tension with the United States. Now, this is a temporary scenario. What Erdogan is going to do in the long run, not even Erdogan may be aware of. You know, that, that's, that's one of the imponderables in the situation. But at the moment, Turkey and uh, uh, Russians are not fighting each other. The Syrian government has not intervened militarily beyond Aleppo city. So, not northern Aleppo, which is where all this is happening, the narrow strip about 35 to 40 kilometers from the Turkish border up to Aleppo city. That part of it still is contested between the Kurds and the Tur Turkish forces and Turkish supported rebel forces with the Syrian government forces really taking a back seat on that. So, that area still remains mixed. Otherwise, I think we are seeing a resolution of the Syrian conflict on the western side, but the northern side with Turkey and Kurds remains complex. We still don't know which way it will go, where it's going to go. And the eastern side has this issue. It's linked to Iraq because here is ISIS also in control of Mosul. And also having seized Pamela recently, there is an issue over there. And the fact that the Kurds are also uh, coming closer to Raqqa. So, there is a triangle over there developing which needs to be studied. But I must point out one thing that the Pamira, when the ISIS uh, seized Pamira again, they came from Mosul. Mm -hmm. And it does not appear that the Americans did anything to hinder that. So, it appears that the Americans want that the ISIS move back mm -hmm. into Syria rather than try and work with Syria to uh, see how ISIS can be can be uh, finished or contained. I mean, what's the way ahead for the Assad government if you look at this entire situation? Uh, and I mean, there's very rare global response to it. So, what's the way ahead for them? You know, the Syrian government, of course, internationally is a small player. The bigger player is, of course, the United States and the NATO forces. If they keep the uh, pot stirring, if they support the proxy war, they continue to support proxy war in various forms, they give them anti-aircraft -air uh, missiles and so on, this can go on for some time. Even if it takes, it, it, it gets resolved one way, which is in, a, in the Syrian government's favor, it can still go on for quite some time before it really falls, you know, completely under the sway of the government forces. So, it really depends on the United States. The question is, Trump had initially talked about being having a different kind of policy for West Asia, where they would not intervene, the America would not intervene militarily so much, where he thought that you know there could be possibility of accommodation with Bashar al-Assad. But the kind of people he's appointing and the whole bunch of people he's appointed, most of them are really uh, different kinds of what would be called the neocons. So, they all seem to also have very aggressive military policy towards West Asia. So, whether it, what will be Trump's uh, policy is the big uncertainty. As we know, our uh, knowledge about Trump, what he's going to do, is has been rather limited. That's all the time we have for today, Prabir, and as the things proceed, we'll be coming back to you on such issues. Thanks a lot.